turns out that uranium has two isotopes. Uranium-238 represents 99.3% of all uranium. Uranium-235 is only 0.7%. But it's this uranium-235 that is the useful thing for fission. It's what we call fissile. And fissile means any speed of neutron can make it fission. Thermal neutrons, the ones you slow down with a moderator, make it fission at a very high rate. So this is what's useful as a fuel. Or this is what's useful to make a nuclear bomb. Uranium-238 is pretty boring. It has a long half-life. The half-life of this is four and a half billion years. Okay, 10 to the ninth. Okay. Half-life of uranium-235 is only 0.7 billion years. Compared to short half-life materials, these are fairly not radioactive because of their long half-lives. But it also means that the plentifulness of uranium-235 over history has clearly changed. But on our timescales of human activity, this is our ratio, 99.3% to 0.7%. The thing is that this is how it occurs naturally. If you want to run a reactor, you need 3% enriched uranium-235, which will mean that uranium-238 is at 97%. This is reactor fuel. The process by which you get from the natural abundance to the reactor fuel is called enrichment. And I should mention, because it's in the news, if you wanted to make a nuclear bomb, you actually have to get up to 90% uranium-235, which of course leaves the rest of it, the 10%, as uranium-238. The same enrichment scheme you use to take naturally occurring ore to reactor fuel, you could keep running for many, many more months or maybe years and reach nuclear bomb grade material. The thing about this is that uranium, as we've talked about, is a plentiful natural substance. So the key to making a bomb is being able to get it to this level of enrichment. Once you have it, the knowledge of how to make a nuclear bomb is actually quite widespread. The gatekeeper to people, or really countries, having nuclear weapons is the ability to enrich it. So let's go back in time to where it was first discovered that you could make a nuclear chain reaction, and then, of course, that perhaps this could be something actually used in wartime. World War II. It was the genesis for creating the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Enrichment is difficult because uranium-238 and 235 are the same chemical. Remember, every one of these uraniums has 92 protons. That's what makes it uranium and 92 electrons. The difference is that the 238 has 146 neutrons versus 143 neutrons for the uranium-235. The only difference is this less than 1% mass difference. And we somehow have to utilize that mass difference to be able to enrich it. Enrichment is a huge effort. In fact, in the 1940s, the U.S. created in part Oak Ridge National Lab for this very purpose. Now this is a modern picture, but still the National Lab was nestled in the middle of the Tennessee mountains, about an hour away from Knoxville, being a place where they could enrich uranium. It's another aerial picture of the lab showing you it's kind of deserted around there. It's also in some beautiful hilly area and a convenient power feed away from massive amounts of electricity. The Tennessee Valley Authority 
hydroelectric dams created to power the gaseous diffusion separation plant at Oak Ridge. You see, the idea to use this giant plant was somehow to utilize the mass difference between the two isotopes of uranium. First, to do that, you have to turn it into a gas. So the uranium fuel was made into the gaseous uranium hexafluoride. And this dilutes the mass difference even further because you've got the fluorine molecules, right? So now our mass difference is exceptionally tiny. But U-238F6 is slightly heavier than uranium-235F6. Very slightly. If I use diffusion, diffusion happens proportional to 1 over the square root of the mass. So, a lighter substance will diffuse slightly faster than a heavy substance. This was the thought of the gaseous separation plant at Oak Ridge. Basically take a filter and put something through it and the heavier stuff won't go through quite as fast. So you need to build a lot of machines because the separation factor using gaseous diffusion between the two different masses is only 1.0043, 4 thousandth of 1% increase in separation. And after all, we're trying to get from 0.7%, if we're making a bomb, all the way to 90%. And every stage only improves you by this much. Here's a picture of a gaseous diffusion system at Oak Ridge. These are large, large containers, and there aren't just four of them, there are thousands. Let's look at a diagram to see how this works. So, the high pressure gas, the UF6, comes in, and these are all your little coffee filters, your diffusion membranes. And of course, what's going to diffuse faster? Something that's slightly less massive, the U235. So here would be the enriched stream, and here would be the depleted stream. Not by some huge factor. Remember this 1.0443? That means if it starts at 0 0.7, right, the depletion and the uh, enrichment fraction goes to something like, well, multiply that times 0.7, we've got something like 0.7003, and 0.6997 through one stage. Then you would take this enriched stuff, put it through another system like this, and it would go up a little bit further and a little down further. You have to take the stuff that was de-enriched and put it back into the first one. And eventually, through massive numbers of these machines and years of doing this, you could get up to the desired enrichment. This was 1940s technology. What about today? Today, we go to something much better called a gaseous centrifuge. Here are pictures of centrifuges. And as you might imagine, in how this demo shows, if you spin something, the heavier part goes out to the side. If the heavier part goes out to the side, the lighter part stays in the middle. These centrifuges spin like tops. Here's another picture, and you need many of them, of course, but their volume is nowhere near as massive as the volume of the types of gaseous diffusion. A diagram that shows how they work is, again, a very similar principle that you feed the gas in, and that as this spins in a circle, the heavier substance comes to the outside of the cylinder that would be the U-238, the depleted uranium. And from the center of the column, you get the lighter gas. That is the enriched U-235. 
the separation factor for a gaseous centrifuge can be as high as 1.5. That's great. You go from 0.7 to all the way up to something that's like 1, right? And down to something like 0.4 or so, all in one step. Many fewer steps are needed to be able to get up to the enrichment level that you would like. That also brings us to a very timely subject, and that's the subject of Iran. Iran has centrifuges to enrich fuel. According to Iran, they want to have a domestic nuclear power program, and they need to make their 3% level reactor fuel. Great. The worry of the West is that they will continue running the centrifuges, and they will get up to the 90% level needed to make a nuclear bomb. They say, no, of course, we're not going to do that. The West says, okay, we'll let us inspect. And even if there's an agreement, there's a worry that is there some diffusion plant one doesn't know about? Is there some centrifuges you don't know about? Are they really being truthful? Have they really already perhaps made the 90% enriched material? I'm not a political scientist. I'm not teaching you a course on politics. I don't know what the answers are, but I want you to understand the technical things that are involved. Making a gas centrifuge that can get this type of separation factor is not trivial at all. It's an extremely high precision device that needs to run extremely tight tolerances. But if you can enrich your fuel from the 0.7% to the 3% reactor, with enough time and money and the very same machine, you can take it from the 3% to the 90%. That's what you need to know about enrichment.